Hi, everyone, and welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is another one of my uh, occasional, regular-ish open Q&As. So uh, rather than picking a topic, I am going to be taking questions from across the piece. Uh, this time we've got uh, a lot of the usual Song of Ice and Fire questions, and also we've got a section of questions about the Lord of the Rings uh, that we're going to cover. So it's probably going to be like that. The last third or so is going to be questions about the Lord of the Rings. Uh, but I just wanted to start with a little personal thank you. Uh, this just a couple of days ago, maybe a few days more, uh, this channel reached 250,000 subscribers, a quarter of a million, and my, it blew my mind. But um, I just wanted to say thank you. If you have supported this channel uh, and me in any way at all, watching the videos, liking, sharing, um, particularly patrons, um, I thank you every time. I mean it every time. Um, this, I, I'm so grateful. And I just wanted to say thank you so much. Um, onwards and upwards from here. Uh, looking forward to carrying on with the great content, I hope. Uh, expanding out to even more Lord of the Rings, The Witcher will be coming back soon, as well as obviously still with the Song of Ice and Fire and all of the Game of Thrones, uh, different strands of, of uh, TV shows and the like that we're going to be expecting coming up there. So a lot to look forward to, but I just wanted to take a moment to thank you uh, for however you have supported this channel, even if it's just watching the occasional video. I really do appreciate it. Um, so the way that we're going to frame this today is uh, we'll look at the Song of Ice and Fire questions first, then Lord of the Rings. As always, the main structure of this is from questions from my patrons. I ask my patrons beforehand if they have any questions, uh, and normally I try and frame them so it's sort of a goes through relatively logically, but as this is an open Q&A, we will be dotting about all over the place, which is uh, great fun for me, um, but uh, also it means we can have uh, things uh, dotting about history of A Song of Ice and Fire, what might happen next in the books, as well as some Lord of the Rings. First of all, just a few quick thank yous uh, for um, uh, Lyle Hammack. I saw couple of very generous super chats before we went on air. Thank you so much. Um, I will answer those uh, questions in the Lord of the Rings section, if that's okay. So if you're watching this back later, then uh, and you don't want to be watching the Song of Ice and Fire content, then scroll forward to, I reckon, about the last third of this will be Lord of the Rings. And I'll, I'll definitely give a, a, as full and strong an answer to them as I possibly can. Mara Lee, similarly, you asked a question about uh, Lord of the Rings. I will answer that one later. Um, uh, Jibba Dole saying, hi, Robert. I watched your video about Ashara. This is Ashara Dane. Um, here you say that she's with Howland. Do you think Mira can become the Sword of the Morning because of this? What will happen to her? Maybe Dark Sister. Okay, yes. Yeah, so for those who have missed it, I am a full disciple of the theory uh, that Ashara Dane and uh, Howland Reed uh, got together and where she is now, her death was faked and she is now with Howland Reed in the neck uh, and she is now the lady of uh, House Reed. That puts her as the mother of Mira and Jojen Reed. I think there's a lot of um, evidence within the books to back this up, but this isn't what this question is about. If you're interested in that, please do go check out my video on it. But um, in terms of what this might mean for Mira, might she become the Sword of the Morning? Um, and what will happen to her maybe Dark Sister? Okay, so the Sword of the Morning, this is the title of the holder of the Sword Dawn, the ancient Sword Dawn, uh, which House Dane hold. This is, it's not something which goes from one person to the next person. It is only given to a person who is deemed worthy of that title. Now, the last person to have it was Arthur Dane, who was obviously the finest fighter in the land, uh, we're told. And after he died, the sword went back, Ned took it back to Starfall, and it stayed there, and the title of the Sword of the Morning has not yet been awarded to anyone else. Now, might Mira get this? I don't think so. She is at the moment far north of the wall, and the distance between her and House Dane, who would be the people who would have to uh, give this honour, 
is just too great in my view. And the sword itself is just a very, very long way away. So I don't think she will. I think Darkstar will probably steal it and call himself either the Sword of the Morning or the Sword of the Evening, perhaps, um, which is the title one other person had taken in the past, and so it's possible that he will do it. So I think he will be the person to be reintroducing the Sword of Dawn back into the story. But what happens to Mira? Well, she's obviously up in Blood Raven's cave with Bran. The Sword Dark Sister, uh, which you allude to here, is the Valyrian Steel Sword, is almost certainly in that cave somewhere. Now, we know um, that this went to the wall. The last known holder of this was Bloodraven, and it went to the wall with Bloodraven. It didn't stay at the wall, uh, and so presumably he took it north when he went north, and so presumably it is in that cave. So what, what's going to happen to it? Well, maybe maybe nothing, maybe we won't hear anything of it, but that doesn't seem likely because it's been mentioned so many times. It does seem likely it will re-enter the story. Now on the TV show, and I try not to put too much weight on what happens on the TV show, but there are a few times that they lingered, they did a few shots uh, that lingered on important things that they weren't actually covering on the show. They knew they were book important, and it was almost that they were trying to give a little nod to book readers to say, this is an important thing, and we know it's an important thing, but we're not covering it. So, for example, the Horn of Winter, the, the magic horn that is uh, that was in that cache of dragonglass that uh, John found, Sam took, they paused and, and showed us that for a few seconds. They didn't do anything with that. Similarly, uh, the Sword Dawn itself that we are talking about a moment in one of the Ned flashback scenes at the Tower of Joy, they paused on that sword so that we could see what the sword looked like. What they did with Mira was they paused with her grabbing a sword on her exit from the cave. Now, I personally think that is just a hint that she will indeed grab a sword and take it uh, with her back down south. And that is how Dark Sister will get reintroduced to the story. Although I did have another thought, which is uh, perhaps slightly heretical, uh, which is maybe Hodor will end up wielding it. Because if he is going to be holding the door, and George R. Martin's been very clear, it's not actually literally holding the door in the books, but actually sort of like uh, defending a doorway, if he's being attacked by the others, by the whites, what weapon will he need? Not just his rusty old sword that he's got. He will need a Valyrian steel sword. So maybe Hodor. But Dark Sister uh, with Mira um, balancing out Dark Star with Dawn, that, that does work for me. So I think that's what's going to happen with her. Um, Kelly Johnson uh, saying, could Jon Snow take the measure of Lynn Corbray? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Lynn Corbray is um, a famous knight uh, in the Vale um, with um, Lady Forlorn, another Valyrian steel sword. I think he could. I mean, I, I think these sort of meetups between different people, sort of who would beat who, I, I I tend not to get into that because it's really about context as much as anything else. But yeah, John is a very good uh, fighter. Um, Annie Clark, thank you so much for the super chat before we went on air, saying, no question, your videos are the reason I could sleep during my last depression. Now I enjoy re-watching while awake and healthy. I can't thank you enough and wanted you to know how much your work improved my quality of life. Well, uh, first of all, I'm really glad that you're... Um, you're much better and healthier now that's excellent and thank you um this is the kind of thing that i it makes me happy the the idea that i can uh, reach out and positively impact on people's lives just simply by doing this it's uh, it's amazing so thank you very much for telling me i'm and thank you for the super chat and i'm just so glad that uh, uh, you can now um, watch the videos when you're um uh, feeling a lot healthier it's um Something people have said to me a lot is that they fall asleep to my videos, and I take that as a compliment. So um, thank you so much. Um, Marvin Martin, uh, thank you. Um, 
saying, any speculations on what Aria told Bath while dying? This is Septon Bath. This is Princess Aria. Um, and uh, she was, this is the story in Fire and Blood. This was when George R. R. Martin suddenly went back to some of his horror roots and gave us a horrific little anecdote of Princess Aria, or Aria, sorry, who was this, uh, she was still young, uh, wanted to fly a dragon, um, got on the back of Balerion the Black Dread, the oldest, fiercest of the dragons then and who had been in Westeros, and could not control it, and it flew off. And we assume that it went to Valyria uh, and came back, and when it came back, Balerion had huge wounds. An area... Um, we get Septon Bath get, gives us this record of her. I mean, it's horrible. So, you know, skip forward if you don't like the details. But uh, underneath her body was burning up, and underneath her skin, there were like worms that with faces, uh, and they could only be destroyed in a bath, bath of ice. And this was really horrifically described. And um, she did mutter stuff mutter some things to Septon Bath. This is what the, it said in Fire and Blood. Uh, Septon Bath says, I pray that I shall soon forget some of the things she whispered through her cracked and bleeding lips. I cannot forget how oft she begged for death. So I can only assume, um, I can only assume that, yes, some of this was begging for death and some of this was sorry. We know that she said sorry and some of what she saw, that's all it is, and the horrors of what she saw, because Septon Bath wanted to forget, and he also talks about, you know, wanting to forget what he saw, so it's the same kind of idea. Basically, it's just she went to Valeria, and what she saw there was horrific. So, what is there? There, there is the remnants and whatever survived from uh, the Valyrian Empire blowing up and exploding in the Doom of Valyria. And what is left are whatever kind of uh, mutant creations that they were creating that could survive immense heat. And that will be hybrid, as far as we can tell, sort of hybrid uh, dragony, wormy, horrible creatures. That seems to be what it is that she saw. Uh, thankfully, no actual dragons who could fly out from there, but uh, lots of things like what crept into her skin. Uh, Ty Farnsworth, thank you so much for the super chat, saying the Horn of Winter equals Dragonbinder? Question um, mark. I'm of the opinion that these are two different magical horns. So Dragonbinder is the one that Euron. Uh, has got. He's given it to Victarion in the books. That does seem to be Valyrian uh, from what the markings are and, and uh, the uh, interpretations that people are given to it, like Makoro has, and also given the fact that Danny has this sudden memory that the Valyrians used to use horns, magical horns, to control their dragons. So that does appear to be a dragon-controlling horn of some kind. It's not the Horn of Winter. The Horn of Winter, as I say, I think almost certainly is that horn that John oh, Ghost found, and John and then Sam took. We're told that it is broken. It is almost certainly important because George R. R. Martin keeps on reminding us that Sam has got it. Sam, he goes all the way down south to Old Town, and while he's in Bravos, basically he has to like sell off everything except the clothes he was wearing and this horn. And so it's clearly going to be important that he has ca carried this horn all the way down south with him. That almost certainly is the Horn of Winter. It is broken, so they can't blow it, use it at the moment, but it will be mended, fixed in some way. Um, question from... Mm -mm -mm. Where have we got to? Uh, Ariel Winchester, hi there. Uh, haven't been on because of school, but wanted to show some love for my favourite YouTube content creator. Oh, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you for inspiring me to read more. Almost done with the Song of Ice and Fire, then moving on to Tolkien. Excellent. I also I love it, the, the idea that I can inspire people to read more. Yeah, if you're uh, almost done with the Song of Ice and Fire, then moving on to Tolkien, um, yeah, let me know how you get on with that. There's uh, 
Lord of the Rings, The Hobbit. I'm currently listening, as well as my re-listen through Game of Thrones, I'm listening through Unfinished Tales, which has got some fantastic kind of background details to what we see and know in um, the world of the Lord of the Rings, like Gandalf's account of uh, what was going on behind the scenes in the uh, the quest for Erebor, which is the, hot, the, the story of the Hobbit. Why did he pick Bilbo? What was his plan? What was he actually thinking around all of this? That kind of thing, as well as the history of people like Galadriel um, and a lot about Numenor, which is where the TV show is almost certainly going to be based. So yeah, do check that one out as well. Uh, Kenny Johnson, um, thank you so much, saying, can Jon Snow defeat Darkstar, the bad boy of dawn? Uh, again, as I say, I think this is really depends entirely on context. context. Um, uh, we, I mean, I, both of them are good fighters, as far as I can tell. Um, the Darkstar probably will have dawn, the, the sword, which is astonishing. Um, but whether they will end up fighting each other, I'm not sure that that will happen. Uh, Uncle Joe, thank you. Regarding the Isle of Faces, what are your thoughts on the Green Men? And do you think there is some sort of super weirwood or all-powerful Bloodraven type being on the Isle? Okay, so um, the Isle of Faces does appear to be um, the hub of the Weirwood Network is probably the best way we can say it. The Weirwood Network, as far as we can tell, is all joined up. The root systems are all joined up across the continent of Westeros. And this is why, incidentally, you'd find that you can't grow a Weirwood tree on the top of the Eyrie because it's the top of a very tall mountain. Why um, there don't appear to be Weirwood trees across great bodies of water. But in the middle of the Isle of Faces, that seems to be where it started. Now, um, the Green Men are legendary people who defend the Isle. Now, what are they? I mean, probably Children of the Forest. That that maybe they are first men who have, as part of the pact, agreed to help defend the Isle of Faces. It, it, we're, we're not 100% sure. Certainly they are magical. Certainly we will meet them in some way, I suspect, in the last two books. And when I say meet, that doesn't mean we're necessarily going to have a POV chapter when somebody goes to there and says hi and shakes hands with, with a, one of the green men. But I think that there are increasing amounts of ways for us to be accessing information about what's happening in different parts of Westeros. We've got Bran through uh, the Weirwood Network. We've got the glass candles that seem to be working now. Um, we've got uh, the, the the warging. Uh, we've got um, lots of different ways where people can now see stuff that's happening in other places. So it's entirely possible that we will see or meet in some way uh, the Green Men. As to exactly what they are, I don't think exactly what they are is the main point it's the it's what their purpose is which is i'm guessing exactly as we're told um to protect the isle of faces because the isle of faces is protected um is there some sort of super weirwood or all-powerful blood raven type being on the island my guess is probably that the weirwood network itself is the the super weirwood. There's a concentration of weirwood trees such as we have nowhere else, and that maybe we could call it a super weirwood, maybe as I say, I call it the hub. Uh, but that does appear to be the focus of green seer magic and energy and the weirwood network. So, uh, I, I don't think well, we, we definitely haven't heard of like a tree rising up above all the rest. But I think it's the focus. And if you imagine trees that you'll have seen trees that sort of lots of them together seem to be sort of growing into one another. That's the kind of feel that I get from the Isle of Faces is, is that it's going to feel like the trees are the island as much as anything else. Um, Fitz. Um, if the Sword Dawn will be brought to King's Landing by Darkstar before abandoning the five-year gap, how would it have been introduced to the story? 
would young Ned have joined Fagon's Kingsguard? Yeah, so the five-year gap, for those who are unaware of it, is that George R. R. Martin, he's gone through various iterations of uh, what the story of A Song of Ice and Fire is going to be like at a sort of a conceptual level, how he was going to write it. He started off writing a trilogy, for example, and then it expanded out. But there is um, a plan that he had for the first couple of books, maybe even three books, of to have a five-year gap. Now, this five-year gap would have allowed the dragons to grow up and all of the main characters to also grow up a bit. Now, exactly what that was and how you would have got all of those different characters to the, the places where they could be so that you could leave them alone for five years. That feels like a bit of a nightmare to me. He clearly at some point thought he was going to take Danny over to a shy and he could leave her there. Maybe Arya could be left in Bravos for five years. I suspect that this was the problem that he came to is that you can't just stop the plot for five years. But, um, what that meant was that he eventually abandoned this idea and stitched it together and, and did a variety of different things. And mostly you cannot see the joins at all because he's an excellent writer, obviously. But there are a couple of points where he's basically accepted the fact that you can see where he changed his mind on certain things. And one of these is the character of uh, Ned Dane. Now, Ned Dane is the heir to House Dane. He's also named after Ned Stark, which, uh, incidentally, for anyone who needs even further evidence that um, uh, this is not uh, N plus A equals J, um, House Dane love Ned Stark. They absolutely adore him. They name their firstborn and heir after Ned Stark. Ned Stark did huge, great things for House Dane. If he had married Ashara Dane, uh, and then taken her child uh, and then slept with one of the servants there and then killed her brother uh, and then she'd committed suicide because of it all, they would not have named their firstborn heir after him. Um, that's an aside. But Ned Dane was going to have a role and we see him in the story. He joins the Brotherhood Without Banners because he is squire to Beric Dondarrion, uh, but he's still very young. Now, it appears that the plan was that he would then depart from the brother, Brotherhood Without Banners and he would be the person who would take the Sword Dawn back into the story. The Sword Dawn, I, I am now, I mean, very, I was going to put a percentage on it, but I'm, I'm not going to. I am now reasonably certain that that will, by some interpretations at least, be Lightbringer. It is the only sword which we know which is old enough to possibly be a Lightbringer, and it will have a very important symbolic role in the last couple of books. Ned Dane was going to be the person to bring it back in, that, but George R. R. Martin abandoned that because of the five-year gap. He was too young to be a fighter, so he had to introduce another character, who is Darkstar, uh, who is sort of from um, uh, an offshoot, so Gerald Dane, an offshoot from the Dane family, and he's very headstrong, and he clearly has a chip on his shoulder about Arthur Dane, who he thinks he could be as good as. So he will definitely, I think, be the character who then brings it back in. Um, would Ned have joined Fagon's Kingsguard? I think so, if the five-year gap would have been there. The, the point about Fagon um, is that when he arrives, he is trying to persuade people that he is the true-born heir, a Targaryen heir. So he is going to surround himself with all of the accoutrements of uh, Targaryen rulership. He will claim the Iron Throne. He will be crowned, I am sure, with one of the historical crowns from the Targaryens. I think he's going to be presented uh, with Blackfire, the historical sword of the kings, the Targaryen kings. I think that he is going to get a king's guard, which as much as is possible, Possible is going to reflect the last 
uh, great in inverted commas king's guard that uh, the targaryens had the one that had um arthur dane in so if he has another dane sword of the morning there then that seems to be an echo again of the previous king previous line of targaryens and so it's the symbols of power this is what he's going to be going for so yes it was going to be ned um uh, and uh it's the it was going to be ned but now it's going to be uh, dark star uh, Kelly Johnson said, could Aldarion from the Lost Tales be the Witch King? Uh, I will answer this one very quickly. This is a Lord of the Rings question for those. This is Aldarion um, from one of the stories in the Lost Book of Lost Tales I was talking about a moment ago. The only story we have of Numenor, which is, in, again, an aside. But with Numenor, if this is the setting as we think it is, of this massive new TV show. We have some background to it. We have the high level story. We know what happens at the end of the time, but for the vast majority of the life, you know, three millennia or so, we don't have much information. We just have this one story of the Mariner's wife, um, which is a very tragic tale. Um, but the Witch King, we do know that there are three um, of the uh, ring wraiths before they were ring wraiths, when they were lords, noble lords, um, powerful lords who were Numenorians. So we could be looking out for them. Could the, the Witch King, the most powerful of them, um, definitely, um, or not definitely, probably was one of those uh, Numenorians. Could it be Aldarion? Personally, I think not. Personally, I think that what we're looking at is somebody who has a magical power. The Witch King is a magician, a sorcerer of the highest level. So somebody, not just a noble lord, but somebody with magical powers. Aldarion did not have those kind of powers over and above what normal Numenorians would. Uh, cloaked one is there a connection between the silent sisters and the faceless men could the sisters be providing the faces for the faceless men um uh, interesting question so the silent sisters are the the people in the, the sort of nuns really in the faith of the seven who care for the bodies of the dead the faceless men we know about so are the silent sisters and the faceless men connected on the face of it pun not intended but it's there if you want it um no because the silent sisters are part of the face of the seven and the faceless men are their own religion uh, the the faces themselves that they use we see Arya does descend down and into the depths of the house of black and white and is given one of these faces they do seem to be prepared in house as it were so i think the short answer is no it's a nice idea but um and the sort of the language obviously works but no i don't think so um kelly johnson are sacrifices needed to keep the deep ones asleep uh, i don't think so so the deep ones this is just something that george r, r. martin uh, mentions uh, i mean sort of offhand um uh in particularly in the world of ice and fire the deep ones are just legends this is a hat tip to hp lovecraft of these great powerful ancient beings uh, who are deep deep underground and should not be uh, raised so i don't think they need that i think they they will sleep unless they're raised, and I don't think they're going to be raised in these stories. Um, uh, Horizontal saying, I doubt you could get a signal at the Eyrie if you're talking about the Weirwood Network. No, you can't. Um, they tried to plant a Weirwood tree there, and it did not work. Uh, Beth Carolan, thank you so much, saying, Hi, Robert. I've been looking forward to this live stream as a reward because I've just finished my degree. Oh, congratulations. Uh, um, I am... Welcome to the big wide world of post degree world. Uh, I, I hope I hope you uh, get an excellent uh, uh, 
classification is that the way, what that right way of saying it um uh, but uh, well done on finishing it that's the main thing will danny get pregnant in the books versus the show um I, well maybe but i don't think this is plot critical there are hints if you go to danny's last chapter in the dance with dragons when she's out in the dothraki sea it does appear that she um her menstrual cycle is returning it's not a hundred percent clear because she takes some berries that do seem to be doing odd things to her mind so we shouldn't take everything exactly at face value, uh, but that does seem to be what's happening. And Miri Mazda, we often talk about it as her curse, you know, having children again, you'll never have children, or when uh, when the sun rises in the west and all the rest of it. That, that was not a curse, that was just her being nasty, in my view. Yes, she had magic, but that's not, I, she wasn't cursing her. So it's possible, but um, will she in the books? I think it would certainly add an extra layer if, as I think will happen, John does kill her in the books if she is pregnant with his child. That would add a layer, and you know how much John uh, George R. R. Martin loves just to rip at our souls with these kind of storylines. That would just be horrific to an extra level so it's possible i don't think it's plot critical um question from i had some more here somewhere uh jeebus east um thank you so much saying yo robert um i didn't sound right saying yo but there we go greetings from the land of always pollen um nc i just wanted to ask about white harbor it seems more important to the world than the story so far. Do you think that is likely to change? It, it is It is important to the world. It's important to the North. So it's one of only four or five cities uh, that are actually named. We've got five. We've got King's Landing, Old Town, Lannisport, Gulltown, and White Harbour. Those are the five cities that are sort of named as being cities in Westeros obviously the only one in the north and it's one of only two real entry points for the north so it is strategically important the importance of it though as much as anything else is the fact that the mandalays control it the mandalays are hugely loyal to the stocks and they are also uh, wealthy and have a uh, large well-trained army so that is the importance of it i don't think sort of going forward it's going to have um, it's, it's not plot critical in the same way that the area around Harren Hall, the Isle of Faces, or Winterfell, or the Wall, or King's Landing, a old town there, plot critical, but it is important to the world and how this whole thing operates. Um, it, so is it likely to change? No, I, th I think we've seen... I mean, we may not actually go back there again. Now, the, the main action there was to get an insight into where the Mandalays are at. And um, we saw that through Davos, and then they've sent Davos off to be trying to get Rick on because they're wanting to be re-establishing Starks at, onto the throne in the north. So uh, I, we may well not actually go back there, uh, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, Kaios Ballerina saying your opinion on Varys. He says he cares about the little people, and most readers believe him. He gets revenge against the men, the man who hurt him. Yet he mutilates children by cutting out their tongues. I think he's a classic George R. R. Martin multi-layered character. I think he does genuinely want to put onto the throne someone who he thinks is a good ruler. He has, let's not face it, let's not um, beat around the bush, he has served some really bad rulers. Aerys II, the Mad King. Robert Baratheon took over. He was not a good king. Joffrey. Then we've got Tommen, but Cersei's effectively been ruling, ruling in his place for a while. He has had a whole succession of terrible rulers. And I think he thinks that he can train someone to do better. 
And I think he's probably right. So the whole point about, or one of the whole points about Fagon is that he will actually, I think, be a good ruler. He will have been trained to care about the normal people of the world, not just the 1% that we're seeing most of this story th through the eyes of. He will be clever, he will be charismatic, he will be caring, um, and he will die. <laughs> I think that this is this is part of the tragedy of it. And Varys's role is that he, like several of the other characters we have, someone like Melisandre, someone like Blood Raven, the same kind of thing, is that he is trying to achieve what he thinks is right and he is happy to do the dirty work around the outside, stay in the shadows, um, because he thinks there is a greater good. And that is where he's at. He's not George R. R. Martin doesn't write purely good or purely evil characters. He writes complicated characters. But one of the types of characters that he likes the most are the ones who are convinced that they are doing good and are convinced that the end justifies the means. And that is the kind of camp that, uh, that Varys sits in. Uh, Jeebus East saying, I also want to ask if you think the others have a leader in the books. My guess is either a hive mind or the Night's Queen, as she is the only mention of a leader for the others in the books so far. Um, yeah, so this is an interesting one because there, um, we had the Night King on the show, but we can't necessarily take that as evidence that there is going to be an equivalent character in the books because the show understandably for for show only audiences they wanted to have a face they wanted to have a figurehead they wanted somebody that you could if not relate to but you could have that moment with john when you get john and the night king staring off at each other while john's on the boat and pulling away from hard home that kind of thing where you have a person at the moment, it's actually working really well for the, the threat of the others that we don't have that kind of personal level. We don't have somebody that we can kind of feel there's a backstory to. So I think George R. R. Martin will keep that going for a little while longer, this mystery, this fact that we do not understand what the, why are they coming, what's happening. This is classic horror stuff. We simply do not understand everything that's going on. And uh, only later will he unravel the layer to make us go, okay, now I get it. They aren't just a mindless force of baddies coming to kill all humanity. They have a reason. They have an agenda. That may well include, as they seem to have some sort of... I mean, George R. R. Martin talks at angles when it comes to the others. Um, he, he says that they don't have a, I can't remember the exact word, but, but he, he argues that they don't have a society, but they clearly do have some kind of civilization. They c communicate, they clearly have developed ways of um, uh, manufacturing really quite beautiful and effective weapons and armor it would appear so there is that and they must have if they've been around for thousands of years they must have some kind of order so i think possibly i like i do like the idea that the knight's queen we talk about the knight's king he was just a member of the knight's watch but the knight's queen being there is one woman who is in charge of this. And this is, again, this is a kind of a theme that we've had. We started out always thinking this was all about men and the male uh, rulers and, and um, all of the heads of the main houses were male. And then the deeper into the story we get, the more we've got Daenerys over there, we've got Asha, we've got Cersei, uh, we've got the Queen of Thorns, we got the female leaders cropping up all over the place, and it would it would be fitting if it's the Knight's Queen, not the Knight's King, but it's not necessary for the book. Um, Boris uh, Orozco, do you think at the end of A Song of Ice and Fire we will see a catastrophic, catastrophic event that change how the seasons behave, uh, like uh, when in Tolkien the world got rounded <laughs> yeah, so Tolkien did this uh, in his world. What we think of as Middle Earth is basically just the continent, Arda being the, the world, and it did start flat, uh, and then, as you say, it got rounded. Um, 
Uh, no. So I think that what, well, I say sort of no, um, because I think the seasons will be put back into order. Now, what if you go all the way back to the first edition of the first book, the back cover, the blurb, which George R. R. Martin will have agreed to, the first line, if you go to it, is, um, and I should memorise the exact line, but it's something like, um, in ages past, a preternatural magical event um, shook the world and put the seasons out of balance. And then it goes on about other things. And this is really important because the because it means that the seasons being out of balance is not just a thing that isn't always the case, but it was caused by something that is central to this plot. So my take is that it has to be the undoing of that thing that will return the seasons to order, not a new cataclysmic event the undoing of the original cataclysmic event and the original catal cataclysmic event um almost certainly is something to do with the others now if this is the creation of the others or if it's the um and and we simply don't have this information at the moment so you can just go off into whichever bit of tinfoil you want but or if it's the opening up of a, a gateway to a different dimension through which the others came the 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 children of the forest i'm pretty sure did a thing a huge bit of magic we know they were doing huge bits of magic the hammer of the waters sundering westeros and essos apart huge bits of magic the creation of the others almost certainly however that happened was the thing which set the seasons out of balance. And in order for the seasons to be put back into balance, then that has to be undone. The, the others have to be undone. This story by a pacifist is not going to end because the humans have got a better army than the others and fight them and kill them all. That's not how this story is going to end. It is going to be undoing whatever it was that brought the others um, uh, in, into existence and in, into conflict with humanity. Uh, Cloaked One, uh, picking up something for Austin Flowers. Thank you so much. You do this a lot, Cloaked One, as do others. I know um, I really love it when uh, people pick up questions uh, from others in the chat. I, I quite often can't pick up all the questions that we go through. So thank you so much. Um, do you know of any comedy influences in George's work? His comedy is pretty deadpan or tongue-in-cheek. Did Monty Python or M.A.S.H. have any known effect on George? Um, well, good question. Well, he does... Um, he does like referencing comedy. So the Tullys, for example, had Elmo and Kermit Tully. Um, so uh, that's... Um, it's very silly, but they were actual genuine characters. And there's also, if you go all the way back to book one, when you get the uh, Tyrion gets captured and Cat uh, takes him off to the Eyrie, there are three um, people. Obviously, Bronn goes with them and Marillion, but then we get three people who go there who all die, and their names are... Um, uh, I can't remember exactly. One of them is Laris um, uh, Cor Corley or something, and Mohor, but they are Larry, Curly, and Mo. <laughs> and that is what that is George, um, George R. R. Martin just doing a little nod to that. So uh, this seems to be how he does um, his sort of references is that he just sort of like drops in a little nod here and there to various things that there are lots of Mervyn Peak references uh for example in House Peak as you'd expect um but the uh, yeah he and we've already mentioned the HP Lovecraft references he drops in references to things he loves and there are a couple of comedy ones in there as well um Think. Am I caught up? No, I've still got a couple more questions in the chat. Um, 
I hope I've not missed any here, but uh, Kissy Teeny, uh, thank you so much uh, for the super sticker. Um, so if, if I'm, I say I hope I haven't missed any because um, some may have gone out off the top of the chat. If they have, uh, apologies, that's because I've not been answering them quick enough. Uh, then uh, mods, if you could pick up any that you think I definitely have missed, that would be great. Um, Kelly Johnson, it will break John to kill Danny with his child. Yes, that's what I uh, suggested may happen. Um, uh, <laughs> Adrian Birchall saying, in Deep Geek, if there is a fourth dragon, will it be called Puff? <laughs> um, maybe. Uh, reflective Rambling. Um, Jamie Lannister. Hi there, by the way. Uh, Jamie Lannister, uh, what do you think Jamie's reaction will be to Fagon returning? He feels guilty for failing to protect Rhaegar's children. Yeah, this was um, something that he was accused of in his Weirwood dream by Rhaegar for not protecting his children, because that was basically what Rhaegar said to him. You know, you look after my children. He was the sole member of the King's Guard left in King's Landing. Uh, we get three of them gone down to the Tower of Joy, three of them fighting at the Battle of the Trident, and Jamie left in the Red Keep. So he does feel guilty. Um, how will he react to Fagan coming? Well, I think, like a lot of people, a, a degree of incredulity that it actually is him. I think that this, I mean, Jamie, I don't think he's going to be down in and around King's Landing. I don't think that's where his story is. I think he's going to be in the Riverlands and then heading north. But if he hears about it, I suspect he would say, go through the same thought process that most other people will be. But I saw his dead body. Well, I suppose, can't be sure it was his dead body because it was mutilated. Um, and... I, I think that that's probably where, as far as he would go with it. By the time he hears about this, he is almost certainly going to be involved in much bigger things, starting to head north, uh, certainly in the, the plots with Lady Stoneheart and all the rest of it, and then heading north after that. So I, I think he will have more important things to be worried about. What his mind will also be concerned with, whether he likes it or not, is the fact that the moment that we hear about Fagon, this is not just some random theoretical thing about, oh, there's this person claiming to be that dead Targaryen. This is somebody who is actively invading and trying to get Cersei, kill Cersei, and get her out of King's Landing. He will be, whether he wants it or not, be caring about what happens to Cersei, and that will probably be where his mind goes rather than existential questions about whether it really is Fagon. But the feeling guilty thing, I think, is is, um, is a really interesting point. I, maybe, he, maybe he will feel a bit less guilty. Maybe that will help him on his, um, what I suspect will be a, an almost redemptive redemption arc. Uh, Sean Stafford, did the position... Uh, of the Three-Eyed Crow or Raven exist before Blood Raven has seen the title? If so, how far back does it go? When did it begin? Um, well, ish. So there, there were people hooked up, or Children of the Forest hooked up, within Blood Raven's cave for a very long time. We see Bran sees them through Hodor's, Hodor's wandering around. Um, he sees all of these children of the forest hooked up in the same way. Blood Raven is hooked up to the Weirwood Network, and it appears the people, people, children of the forest, have been there for a very, very, very long time. The Three-Eyed Crow as a title, I think we sometimes think of this as being a title. It's not. It's a description of Blood Raven's avatar is the, probably the best way I could uh, come across this. The way the, the the way that the sort of the green dreams seem to work is that you you have a an appearance there within that green dream, and and this seems to be the same for, across a lot of magic. There, there's a huge amounts of crossover here. Um, and that is an expression of who you are. 
So Bran, for example, when he is seen by uh, Jojen before they meet, um, he is a, a winged wolf held down by chains. This is symbolic language because he is a wolf. He's a Stark. Winged is the magic held down by chains uh, because um, he, at the time, he, he was being prevented from um, unleashing his magical power. That is a sort of a um, what his avatar looked like, and so Jojen was looking for this. He was he was trying to figure out who this person is. He did not get a name. It did not come up with a little tag saying this is who, uh, you know, this is Bran. He just has this kind of avatar image. It's the same for the three eyed crow. That is what Bran sees. That is what the the avatar representation of Blood Raven is. Blood Raven does not know what he looks like, no more than Bran knew what he looked like. Um, and so when Bran comes to him and says, Are you the three eyed crow? and he and Blood Raven goes, Ah, okay, makes sense. Um, that's that's what it is. So it's it's not a title, it's a description of the avatar, if that makes uh, any kind of sense. It's quite a, a weird way of doing this with George R. R. Martin, but I think it I, I think it's quite cool. Um, Melissa Gill, thank you. Speaking of Varys, what is the point of cutting out kids' tongues if they can write down messages? Seems like needless mutilation. Yeah, um, it's it's the gossip as much as anything. I think most of them can't. Maybe some can, but um, it's it, it's also an an element of control. So Tyri uh, so Euron does this. It's um, uh, yeah, I, I I agree with you. It is it, he's not a nice man, and this is something that that George R. R. Martin does a lot is to have people that we may agree with a, a certain amount of what they um uh what they want, but they're not good people. Um, question from. Uh, I think I've got another question in the chat. Um, uh, Veronica, what is one tinfoil theory you hope is true? <laughs> um, I'm thinking of doing a tinfoil theory live stream at some point, by the way. Um, let me know if you like the idea of that and pitch your tinfoil theories at me and I'll tell you what I think. Um, but what is one tinfoil theory? I mean, tinfoil. I, the, the problem is the kind of theories I like. I personally don't think a tinfoil, and which is why I like them. Um, in terms of a tinfoil theory, um, I've got a. I, I don't think this is tinfoil at all, but I've, I've got one uh, question coming up later about the identity of Lem Lemon Cloak that I adore. Um, I don't think, as I say, I don't think it's tinfoil. I think it's very well worked out, but I don't think that we have got the evidence for it um uh, okay question from mm, 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 mm. uh kelly johnson john snow's berserk strength allows him to beat a white walker uh so john snow's berserk strength he does seem to when when he gets mad it's the kind of thing you only notice when you read the books again. When he gets mad, he does get very strong. It does feel like a berserker strength. When he goes to attack um, Alistair Thorne, he has to have four people pulling him off. This is this is quite uh, an impressive. Uh, would it help him defeat a White Walker? No, it's not strength that helps defeat the White Walkers. It's the weapon that you're using. Um, so the if he's got a, a valyrian steel sword or dragon glass then yes that would work a uh, question from stephanie lash thank you very generous thank you very much uh thanks robert love your work whether baking traveling or just chilling you always teach and entertain me well thank you i'm really glad i do question do you see brand's story as triumph or tragedy or something else Ah, uh, triumph or tragedy. I, I think we have to remember that Bran 
at the start of this was six and then start to look at everything that's happened to him since and he has been manipulated he has been um taken away from his family home um taken off up north beyond the wall um taught to do things that um, yes he may uh, want to do but at the same time he's not really got much choice um he is not actually being taught to control the things that he should be being taught how, how to control like his walking ability um sorry if you hear a shaking dog in the background dan is wandering around downstairs so uh, that's my dog um but uh so he it i find it incredibly sad these things that happen to a young child so um, that's probably, I mean, tragedy is closer than triumph would be what I would say. And I think that we will see increasingly Bran being taken over by the Weirwood Network and it will be a manipulation of him. So that's my that's my take. Um, oh, Reflective Round being saying the question was on the behalf of someone with a screen named Jamie Lannister. Well, thank you very much for picking that one up, uh, Reflective Rambling. Uh, apologies that it said J Jamie Lannister. I thought it was just a question about uh, Jamie Lannister. Um and I, th I think I've got another question. Um, Elizabeth Clare, uh, why did Illyrio send Barristan to Danny instead of Fagon? If Fagon wanted to appear to be the Targaryen heir with the crown, sword, etc., then wouldn't it have been better to send him to Fagon? Yes. Um, and he may end up with Fagon. Um, this is one of those things I'm increasingly wondering, uh, for all the reasons I said before, uh, about Fagon wanting to recreate the sort of the Kingsguard of uh, Aerys II. Um, and George R. R. Martin has said that he he did change his mind about a character and, and have a introduce a plot twist. Uh, this is, I don't know, three, four, five years ago, um, that he was considering uh, about a character who died in the on the show um but he's going to do something interesting with him uh, and lots of speculations could this be stannis it's possible that this is it's a barristan who will learn about fagon when he when Tyrion he meets Tyrion, Tyrion will tell him because Tyrion was traveling with fagon and it's entirely possible that if he thinks danny is dead and she has been gone for a long time he may go over there but anyway, that's a digression. Uh, why didn't Illyrio send him to Fagon first? Well, firstly, because Fagon wasn't ready. They were not ready for that uh, part yet. Um, and secondly, although this plan, it's I, I will at some point do a video trying to set this out, because the plan seems to shift. They seem to be trying to keep it quite um, flexible. But the plan at certain stages certainly was that he, that Fagon would marry Danny, and that they, between them, would be launching this invasion. Now, therefore, you want to have one of your people, yes, obviously with Fagon, but also somebody over with Danny as well. So that probably was what it was, was this was a long term plan. We send him over there thinking that when he discovers about, uh, Fagon, he will try and get the two of them together because that would be a logical thing for him to do. Um, people are liking the idea of a tinfoil uh, stream. Okay, well, I will see what I can do on that one. Um, and I think I've got one more question in the chat before I try to pick up on uh, questions from my patrons. Uh, Coach one, again, picking up something from the chat saying, Thomas uh, de Kirschmecker. Um, apologies for mispronouncing your name, Thomas. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about Varamir Sixkins? I didn't really get why he was, why he was suddenly added to the story, maybe foreshadowing John going into Ghost. I think that that is the answer. 
so Vanamir Six Skins uh, is, I mean, we met him but uh, earlier on, but he appears in prologue. Um, and uh, the prologue at the end of which the book at which John dies. Now, the prologues aren't just random, extra, interesting chapters. They're there to set a tone. They're there to set, um, to give us information. They're there to help us um, often trace things right across to the end of the story. Now, Varamir Sixkins, uh, what did we learn? Well, we learned a lot about warging, basically. Uh, we that's the main point of it this applies to bran because we start and i talked about this just a moment ago but we hear about what the rules are for skin changes you don't uh, take it over the body of another human being you don't if you're in your animal you don't eat human flesh these are the room and he is breaking them we're seeing he's a bad person but bran's doing all of this but Brands had nobody to tell him not to. So he's just naturally going off and, and charging his way into Hodor's brain and pushing Hodor aside and taking over. Brand doesn't know this is wrong because nobody's telling him, but we can see it's wrong through v Varamir. And f finally, fundamentally, with the, the, the link across to Jon Snow, is that it shows us when Varamir dies, he goes out from his skin, and he goes to find his wolf. And we get a description of what it's like, um, that process. And what happens is he thinks, he calls out for his wolf, and then he feels cold. And uh, then he feels no more. And if you then look at the description of what happens to John, the last thing he says is ghost then he feels cold, then he feels no more. He is doing the exact same thing unconsciously that Varamir did. And the Varamir thing, when he's going looking for his ghost as this kind of spirit, he even goes, oh, there's Jon Snow's direwolf. Should I try going in there? No, I'll go to my one. So it's, it's not just foreshadowing so much as telling us what's about to happen. So it's... Um, uh, that's the point of it. It was it's to give us an understanding of how skin changing and warging works, uh, showing us that Bran is not necessarily doing the right things, and showing us what John will be able to do at the end. Um, question from. Mm -mm. Uh, uh, Gerard Hughes, I'm sorry, I mispronounced your name, I'm sure. Um, hi, Robert, I heard a throwaway line in an Alt Schwift X video, and Cersei ripped up Rob's will and set me thinking, might this be foreshadowing for what might happen when Rob's will reappears? Um, yeah. so Rob's will. I mean, I don't, is it foreshadowing? I don't know. So Rob's will, the clear implication, and we don't know all of the words, the exact words. I, I discussed this uh, with Learned Hands podcast when they came on ages ago. It's a fascinating discussion. Uh, that the exact words themselves are the kind of things that could be interpreted in a million different ways. With the presumption is that he's uh, legitimizing John and making him Lord of Winterfell, making him a proper Stark. But what are his words? Uh, does he say, given the fact that Bran and Rickon are both dead, Rob, uh, John, I hereby legitimize John? Because on that basis, actually, Bran and Rickon aren't dead. So does that make that null and void? Uh, there is a lot of legal uh, stuff which we surrounding there, but. What this is all leading to is the position where we are going to suddenly have lots of, from there being no Starks, lots of different Starks who each have a claim of sorts to Winterfell. They may not all wish to press that claim, but there will be people who support them. So there will suddenly be lots of camps. Again, this is a thing they tried to do on the show, that there was 
um, sort of antagonism between different stocks. It's not going to be like that, but it's more about the people supporting different stocks to it. So we will have the the will which will legitimize John, and and John will almost certainly, I suspect, be made king of the north on the back of that. However, there will be some who, not knowing anything about that, not knowing where Bran is, they want Rickon to be the king. This is the Manderley plot we've got going on there. Bran, when he reappears, will actually also obviously have a claim. He probably won't want it, but he was the next in line after Rob. Then you've also got Littlefinger, who I suspect will think to himself, hang on a moment, there's no uh, Bran, there's no Rickon, um, uh, John is illegitimate, who's next in line? Sansa, and he will try and get Sansa onto the throne. So we're going to have different uh, sort of people trying to support their claimant, and this is going to be echoed by what's happening down in King's Landing. So that is th that is what's going to happen. There will be people who want to... I've not seen that vi video from Alt Drift X, but I, there will be people who want to rip it up, either physically or, or, lit or figuratively, um, but it's pointing to a bigger picture that there will be a number of claimants. Um, Plum Kettle saying, thank you for all your hard work. I have recently become a member of your Patreon too. Well, welcome. Thank you so much. It gives me a chance to say thank you to my patrons properly. Uh, thank you, not just for the support getting me up to 250,000, which is amazing, but thank you. Uh, it, it's your support that allows me to keep on uh, producing uh, the videos, devoting the time to researching things for for these live streams so thank you so much if you are interested in being a patron it's the best way to support this channel there's a link down in the description and patron questions get priority uh when i finish answering these ones in the chat i will charge through uh over to my patreon questions uh james palm consilio et labore uh i will allow greater scholars than me to uh, interpret that one, but thank you so much for the super chat. Um, and uh, so Michael the Tall. So in my head canon, R plus L equals J and M. Mira looks nothing like Jojen. She's given Stark-like descriptions. It would make sense to separate twins and she'll be leaving the cave with Dark Sister. What do you think? Um, I, I, I don't see any plot reason for it, is my short answer. Um, yes, theoretically, you could separate twins, but my we're, we're told that she's about the same age. I think a lot of this comes from the fact that the, uh, the actress who played Mira had the very same kind of curly hair as Kit Harrington. Um, and they did look alike, and I think that's a look alike, and I think that sort of prompted a lot uh, of theorizing on this. But um, it works for me. It, it works better if she is the heir of um, Howland and Ashara. Now, as for the looking different to Jojen, we're told that. Um, his appearance did change. He got very sick when he was younger uh, and his appearance did change as a result of that. So I don't think we should read too much into that. Uh, but we would expect there are two. If Ashara and Howland are together, they are physically very different people. So uh, Howland is a stereotypical uh, Kranach man and Ashara Dane uh, has the sort of the purple eyes, dark hair of um, the uh, the House Dane, who are almost it appears that they're almost a completely different standalone kind of uh, genetic inheritance to the rest of the continent. Um, Ryan Larkin, uh, thank you very much for the super sticker. And 
uh, cloaked one been rereading the Witcher series, and it struck me that the in the I can never pronounce it. The the she is, lingu is linguistically similar to the Aos C from Celtic mythology. Your thoughts on George R. R. Martin possibly getting some inspiration for the others from there? Uh, yes, uh, absolutely. So the she the, the fairies um, in sort of Celtic mythology. Um, uh, and when we're thinking of the fairies, this is not the sort of the modern fairies that we think of, like the Tinkerbell with the wings and all the rest of it. This is, if you've ever read uh, Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, uh, that kind of ethereal, very, very different, very magical, not to be trusted, and uh, having a, a completely different... Uh, feel to the rest of uh, of the world, otherworldly. That is 100% where he's coming from. George R. R. Martin describes them as an, another, they're not undead, they are another form of life. They're another type of life. So that is very much the feel that he's trying to get across here. These are almost, they're beautiful they're almost ununderstandable and beyond human uh, conception. So, yes, he definitely did. And I think he said as much um, that he's taken inspiration from that. Um, Sean uh, Safford saying, OK, but Bran became the Three-Eyed Crow, not his own avatar. Seems to me like the Three-Eyed Crow is like the Dalai Lama, a lineage of green seers who made their move. Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, it is... Um, uh, the there there has been a succession of people there, but that is not the. Um, I think the point I'm trying to make is that it is not a particular um, title which is passed down from one person to another. Yes, there are a succession of people who reach out, uh, but this is not uh, a succession of I'm now passing the uh, crown onto you or something like that. Um, so I, I like the Dalai Lama idea, um, but I, I think it's slightly more sinister than that as well. Uh, Chaos Ballerina, uh, will Bran or Sansa have children, or will the official Stark line end? You compared Sansa to Elizabeth I, who was the last Tudor. Um, yes, so I did. Will Bran have children? No, certainly not in this book. Um, he's far too young. Will Sansa have children? Not in this book, I personally, or not in the story. I personally think it will probably be left open whether she might. Yes, she definitely has um, Elizabeth the First vibes to her. From her story arc perspective, where she's coming round to is that she's she's been abused by a lot of men. Um, and she's starting to think back on this. And where she needs to be is somewhere that she can be not under anyone's control. She can be in charge herself, which is why it makes sense that in the books as well as on the show, she ends up as the Lady of Winterfell, that she is in charge. There's no one else who can control her. She is in charge of her own destiny. And that also includes not being forced to marry people that she doesn't want to. The small caveat to, to that is that with Tyrion, as an example, she can now look back and say that actually she was safe with him. Um, similarly, she may well be able to look at people like Sandor and say that. So she will, I suspect, get to a point where she recognises that there are people that she could be safe with, um, even if she doesn't get together with those people. So uh, will she have children? We'll never learn that in this book uh, or this book series, I suspect, but um, it's it's open. She may well have children for the sake of keeping a Stark there, I guess, but she would be very picky about who. Uh, Adam D, uh, thank you very, very uh, generous. Uh, thank you. Thanks for your Lord of the Rings lore coverage. Uh, thanks to you, I'm giving the Silmarillion a read for the first time. 
Good luck. Um, read Lord of the Rings back when I was a young teen in the 90s. Will you do a video on Old Man Willow, or have you done one already? Um, so um, Old Man Willow is, uh, they sort of did a reference to it in the, the, the movies, but he's a book-only character. He is in the Old Forest, an ancient gnarled old tree, gnarled old tree that um, basically captures and, um, and nearly kills the hobbits before good old Tom Bombadil comes by and rescues them. Um, I have not done a video on Old Man Willow specifically. I have done one on Tom Bombadil, if you're interested, um, and I'm sure I will at some point get to one about Old Man Willow. Um, as for the Silmarillion, great. Um, it's I know a lot of people find it quite uh, hard going. It gets easier the further in you go, and certainly on a second reading it gets easier. Um, if you imagine it being a bit like reading the old testament that's probably what it is there's a huge amount in there but that, that there are some parts that are quite a lot of names and that you have to work your way through uh, but it's well worth it is what i would say um question from charlie duart would the dragon binder horn really work on danny's dragons it could well we've we've no way of knowing until it's tried the the fact is that euron thinks it will and euron's understanding of this probably comes not so much from uh, knowledge and law and understanding of ancient valeria but from his magical um visions by having the shade of the evening so that seems to be where he's getting that from uh Makoro, the red priest who is currently advising victarion um he certainly seems to be implying that it would but then he we have to remember he has been sent to aid danny is he really going to be there helping victarion steal one of danny's dragons not sure so um well in fact it's not i'm not sure no he's not he's going to try and stop victarion stealing one of danny's dragons um so will it really work it should do it should do but we will only see when it happens because uh what we've got is euron's got a plan he's bound himself to the horn this was as far as we can understand bound himself to the horn and then uh when it gets blown the idea that that a dragon that is then under his control. Victarion has a plan that it then becomes under his control. Makoro is trying to probably going to try and scupper these plans. We just have to wait and see what happens, is the, the short answer. But in theory, yes, there is no reason why it wouldn't. Okay, uh, let's go with some questions from my patrons. Uh, Shah Shah saying, Hi, Robert. I hope you are well. I am. Thank you very much. Uh, how do you think the men of the Night's Watch pay the sex workers of Molestown? Given the penal colony attitude of or character of the order, I am having trouble to believe that they are actually paid at the wall. Um, now, I'm delighted you uh, asked this because this is one of those very rare occasions where George R. R. Martin was asked this specific question and actually gave a straight and specific answer to it. It's it's very rare these days. I mean, he doesn't make many appearances these days, to be honest. And when he does, they're very um, managed. And uh, when he does get asked questions, then he has a habit of uh, not answering that he thinks might give any new information. He has a, a way of not answering them. But this he did. And so I will read out uh, exactly what he says. Uh, a lot of the Molestown transactions are paid by barter, certainly, but there is coin at the wall. Not much, though, especially these days. Some coin comes north with the highborn brothers, someone like Sir Waymar Royce, undoubtedly arrived well-heeled. And I imagine families send gifts and such as well, and there's trade that goes in and out of Eastwatch. So, um, the, uh, the, the feel is that Sometimes this is just by 
um, exchange exchange of goods and services, shall we shall we put it that way? Um, this seems to be how a lot of the the um, exchange happens anyway in the north. Is that uh, people don't just pay in coin if they don't have any coin, then they will uh, give their free labour. So maybe swapping a, a, a something of value. But in terms of coin, so the whenever rich people go north, they take their money to the wall. They take their money with them, and then other, yeah, they will then use this to be buying stuff from other people at the wall. And so there is some coin uh, moving around in the system. <laughs> 